Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Happy Tuesday. <clears throat> we are uh, now live on our uh, monthly real estate live uh, session. Uh, special guest today, uh, California Association of Realtors, uh, Chief Economist Asko Way. We're going to get to him in a few minutes from now. So a few things that we're going to start in advance. And uh, if you uh, cannot um, watch this session right now, it's been recorded. So uh, you uh, will you know, be able to, uh, <coughs> uh, to watch this later. Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, Mary, are you on? Yeah, yeah. Go for it. You're always one decision away from a totally different life. Mel Robbins. You're always one decision away from a totally different life. What does it mean to you, Mary? Well, it means that every decision that we make, it, it impacts our future, or actually our present and our future. What we do in the past, we can't control it, but whatever we decide to do right now impacts us within the next minute, five minutes, an hour, or you know, in, in real estate, world, we, you know, we're constantly looking at long-term. So the step that we take, the decision that we make, we have to make sure that we're doing it purposely and, you know, thoughtfully. Spot on. Spot on, Mary. Thanks for sharing. Um, thank you for that. Uh, a few promos uh, for the, uh, for the month, for the week. One second. Oops. Just talking to a few more people. Um, we have um, Mega Camp uh, next week. Uh, if you are attending, uh, it's going to be, uh, I think, the first since 2019, uh, live in Austin, Texas, a couple of days, three days, two and a half days in Austin with Gary Keller and um, the entire leadership teams. And if you're not able to uh, physically uh, attend, there's going to be the uh, online uh, version. So you can register. I think it's. Uh, 189, if not mistaken. So that's, uh, that's one thing to share. The second thing, <clears throat> uh, more and more, uh, if, you know, if it's the visions or uh, different resources are being added, uh, it seems like every month to uh, our company, uh, KW. So uh, just uh, if you missed the new, the recent news, uh, so KW introduced a few uh, other divisions or resources. One is uh, Heather and Kelly, who are leading the KW Style to Design, which is education resources of uh, uh, interior designs uh, and help agents to secure uh, listings. <clears throat> so we're going to hear more about that in the near future. That's very innovative as well as a, as a company uh, to offer that, that resource to agents. Uh, KW Relo uh, Relocation, uh, Christina Griffin, she's on it. Um, I've seen a few of her sessions. So if you want to get, you know, a bit more curious in depth into training and uh, different, you know, certifications on each element of the relocation process, the relo, uh, you know, get on, on um, Christina's um, uh, program, right? And on a side note, if you don't really know where to get that information, or if you're not getting emails from KW directly, let us know, we're going to fix that for you. And uh, <clears throat> lastly, uh, Brett Tanner, uh, he's heading the KW Wealth, which basically uh, their goal is to empower agents to use, uh, uh, you know, uh, your unfair advantage in real estate as a, the gatekeeper and uh, use the, your expertise to build uh, passive income for yourself as uh, investors as well, not just uh, as advisors in addition. So just kind of, uh, you know, that's kind of brief. <clears throat> I'm not going to go over the entire calendar, but we have a lot going on between uh, our um a few offices in uh, Long Beach Coastal, South Bay, LA Harbor. So please uh, jump on. You can always go to our uh, any of our hubs resources site. If it's uh, kwcoastalhub.com, uh, kwlaharbor.com, kwsouthbayhub.com, and um, uh, look at what we have going on. Uh, and a uh, couple of classes that we just wanted to promote. Um, Monday, August 29th, 1 p.m., uh, how to master the intro call to uh, the leads. We have partnership with realtor.com. 
uh, and uh, version of App City. So if you're newer to it or just want to get the refresher, so that's that, uh, August 29th, 1 p.m. <clears throat> and our concierge, the concierge, uh, seller concierge. Next session is September 15th, 10 a.m. <clears throat> uh, just for you to know how to leverage the, uh, the program, um, have better you know, presentation to your clientele. They do offer various uh, products and services, not just for the seller, uh, sellers themselves, but tune in on September 15th, 10 a.m. And with that, <clears throat> we'd like to introduce our um, main speaker, guest speaker. Uh, I'm going to uh, give you some uh, kind of uh, bio as well. Just give me a second. Uh, Oscar, are you um, in here? Yes, I'm here. Okay, I'm going to just uh, spotlight you for everybody. There we go. And a quick intro about Oscar. I mean, uh, pretty much everybody knows uh, you by now, and you've been a consistent guest, uh, honorable guest, uh, at least twice a year, giving us some uh, insights uh, about what's happening with the economies uh, or, or stats in real estate. So, you know, state of the economy in real estate uh, overall and specifically here in California. Um, Oscar Way is the uh, deputy chief economist of the California Association of Realtors, a statewide trade organization of real estate professionals with more than 200,000 members. He, um, <clears throat> sorry, I, I, I'm, I'm looking at my cell phone, so I apologize. Um, he oversees the research and economy, uh, economic department and oversee the operations of data analyt uh, analytics and survey research within the division. As, the, as an economist at CER, ASCA provides regular updates on the economy, state and regional housing markets, consumer behavior and public policy issues. So Oscar, I wanna ask you something. Sure. Um, what have changed um, with you or the CER the past, um, the past eight months or so before your presentation? There are there are there have been you know quite some changes and you know that we have a new president uh, and uh, uh, Joel uh, retired and uh, late last year and we have a new president but at the same time you know there have been a lot of changes you know there have been a lot of changes in programs and things like that you know some of the changes that we in the research and economics department have done is you probably have already seen some of the new dashboards that we have put up on the uh, on our website. That's something that we, you want to continue to visit. Now, of course, we also have been seeing a little bit more in-person interactions. Um, we started uh, in what uh, two years ago with uh, more virtual uh, uh, presentation, and we're doing more in-person now. Um, I'm still doing, you know, virtual, uh, quite a bit of virtual, but at the same time, we're doing more in-person and we will be doing more in-person in the upcoming months. But, you know, if you look at the market, there have been a lot of changes in the market. You probably have noticed the shift, you know, they call it the downshift or whatever the market shift is. And we are, uh, we're adjusting accordingly. Uh, we are trying to share, you know, information, insights about consumers, and you will be seeing some of those consumer insights information coming from our consumer reports, as well as the annual housing market reports, which some of you have taken. Um, obviously, there will be more changes, and if some of you, uh, I'm sure many of you are going to attend the, uh, the REI to reimagine in October, you'll see some of those changes, and one thing that you will be able to find um, that we are making changes off is, you're going to see us uh, there, the research and economics divisions there with a booth. So feel free to come by and uh, hopefully we can chit chat a little bit. Fantastic. All right. Thank you, Oscar. So the, the stage is yours. You can share your screen um, and take it away. Great. Thank you, Manny. Let me just uh, share my PowerPoint as usual. Uh, let me pull it up and let me uh, make this a presentation mode. So here we go. Um, as many of you said, there have been you know, changes in the past eight months or so. I think last time when I was here, it was what, January or so? Things were a little bit better in terms of sales. Uh, 
in terms of you know the volatility it's not as much volatility but we can we actually start seeing a little bit of uh, fluctuation in, in terms of demand at the end of last year now definitely at the beginning of this year maybe not the last time when i was here but we started seeing um soon after you know uh the mid-january or so we started seeing some increase in um in, in interest rates pretty significant increase in, in fact so in the next uh, 45, 50 minutes or so, I'm going to go over the uh, market. We're going to start off with a market update. We're going to talk about, you know, how uh, sales and prices have changed in the last uh, eight months or so. Supply, how supply might have improved in the last couple months, three or four months or so. Uh, but that all, you know, predicated on, you know, a lot of the economic factors, some of the economic variables that you guys are very familiar with uh, probably by now is the inflation. You know, a lot of the talk and discussions about inflation in the last probably 12 months, a uh, year and a half or so, it was not as uh, big of, of a concern at the end of last year or a second half of last year, but it started getting a little more, bit more concerning and it's affecting our housing market industry. Um, and of course, there are other concerns as well as, you know, the Federal Reserve started trying to tame down inflation. There are also concerns about that it may pull, it may actually push the economy into a recession, which you might have uh, heard of uh, in the last you know three or four months. Now, at the end of the uh, uh, last 15, 20 minutes or so, we're going to put everything together. We're going to look at the market data. We're going to look at you know the big picture, and we are going to try to figure out you know the uh, the market outlook. I obviously have you know some insights and some opinion about what's going to happen in the next few months or so, and what's going to happen in twenty twenty three. But at the same time, I know you know from you you guys have you know, your boots in the ground. You know you know some of the information that I may not be aware of. So at the end of our uh, discussions, hopefully we have a Q and A sessions and we can have you know a little discussions. Uh, I do have to apologize. I have a uh, eleven o'clock meeting also uh, today, so I might have to cut out uh, very soon after the uh, the presentation. But I'll do my best to uh, get all the information. But at the same time, I'll have my contact information at the very end. So if I don't get to finish all the uh, Q and A that you guys have, you know, just feel free to send me you know an email. So let's get started. Uh, let's take a quick look at you know the the market. Now I only have data through June. I have data. We will be releasing our numbers actually um, to uh, uh, tomorrow uh, on July uh, tomorrow. So I have some numbers uh, in my mind, but I can only uh, show them on screen. But I'll talk talk about them verbal. Now take a look at the market snapshot for the first half of the year uh, as of June. That was from the latest uh, release that we had. You can see in the, uh, uh, there are some numbers, sales, price, inventory, and you know, some market competitiveness uh, figures. But let's take a look at the sales number first. This number shows that you know, the, uh, the sales in June actually dropped by 20, 21%. Um, and you know, when you take a look at the first half of the year, it actually dropped by 11% for the first six months. Um, I was just running some number on the July uh, sales. And July actually turned out to be even worse. Uh, July sales actually dropped by about you know thirty uh, percent or so. We're actually down to uh, below three hundred thousand for the first time in July, and for the first time since maybe about 25, 26 months. So it's pretty scary, you know, to see that sales actually started declining really, really fast. Um, and but price actually hold on a bit more. Uh, it is not at remember you know in um, May, we actually uh, uh, record a, uh, a peak price in May. And in May, for the state, median price actually hit 900000 900000 and then, of course, in June, it started dipping. And then in July, it actually um, slowed down a little bit in July. But on a year-over-year -year basis, it still shows a, uh, a positive number. Not as much as you know what we saw in the past of 10%, 11%, and 2 but it's coming down to maybe about a mid single digits. So sales wise, it's actually slowing down a little bit um, and um, price it's actually stabilizing, but still at a level that is a little bit elevated compared to let's say a year ago. Now with sales down, we also are seeing a little bit more inventory. The supply side actually show an increase. Here it says you know 2.5 months as of June, but I can tell you that in July, it actually increased a little bit more. 
it increased above to uh, it surged above the three months of inventory. Now, some of you may know in a past or before the pandemic, three months and four months are actually you know the norm. Even though you know in the long run that's actually still considered a sh uh, supply shortage, but we're actually getting back to you know three or three and a half months of inventory. So that's getting better as far as supply is concerned. But at the same time, it's still the market continued to, to be competitive because that three months or two and a half months of inventory is still a very tight level. Now, how are sales being affected in terms of individual price level? You probably have seen in my uh, uh, past slides that um, when I show this sim uh, similar slides by price segments, the upper price segments tend to be, or in the last few sessions that I, I presented, they actually have been showing you over a year increase. But take a look at the latest that we have for June. It shows sales at individual price segments actually declined for all price segments, including the higher price segments, including the million dollar and the two million dollar home. In fact, you know the million dollar uh, in this in, in June actually. The $2 million actually dropped for the very first time, $2 million plus actually dropped for the very first time uh, since maybe uh, in the last 12 months or so. So sales actually softening a little bit in the higher price segments. Um, it actually dropped quite a bit uh, by 20%. But remember, last year, you know, at this time of the year in June or July, we actually had a pretty strong market. So a drop of 20% at the higher price segments uh, is also still uh, decent. But of course, it's concerning because we started seeing some drop off. Now, what, what about, what, why are we seeing some drop off? Now, before we get into the actual uh, economic and uh, uh, the economic variables and uh, the variables uh, behind it, let's take a look at how the drop off actually could affect you know, the, uh, the, the mix of sales. The mix of sales is important, uh, especially since you know, mix of sales actually is uh, being used uh, later on, you will see in my uh, slide, and determining home prices and determining the median price. Now take a look at the uh, mix of sales change. I have two lines here, or actually two lines and three bar, uh, 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 two sets of line and then one set of bar. Um, you can see that green line right here, those are the share of, that represents the share of a million, uh, million dollar homes. So you can see right around, you know, the COVID-19 outbreak, we started seeing the share, you know, started climbing because the, higher end or upper end actually sells uh, a bit better. The performance in the market segment and, and the million dollar plus and up actually started doing a bit better. In fact, it has gone up from somewhere around 18% all the way to around 35% as of, I think, May of 2022. But you can also see the last couple of months, it started actually slowing down from 35% all the way to 33. And I can tell you that uh, in July, it actually dropped down to 30%. So we're seeing some dip in the million dollar home sales, but at the same time, the share for the sub 500 actually start picking up again. Now this mix of sales change has some impact on you know, price change on the median price. Um, you, can, you will see that median price actually start you know, slowing down. And part of it is because of the mix of sales. We are seeing fewer million dollar sales and that actually changed the median. The median is the, 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 the price for the uh, sales right in the middle. So if we have fewer median uh, million dollar home sales, obviously that could affect the, uh, the, the sales right in the middle. Now, what about the reason behind you know, the dip you know, uh, for, for the sales? You, you probably already know prices or uh, uh, interest rates have been rising. Look at the interest rates on the left-hand side. You know, we are, I'm showing Freddie Mac and Mortgage News Daily number. It may not have the latest latest, uh, but it's actually very close. The Freddie Max number actually dipped below, you know, 5% a week or two weeks ago. It's just start, started bouncing back, I think, last week to 5.22% for the 30-year fixed rate. Um, and the uh, blue line is the mortgage daily, daily number, which I look at because, you know, uh, the Freddie Max number is a weekly number. It might not necessarily be the most um, current. So the mortgage news daily number, if you look at both lines, you know, you can see right here, right around mid-June, we started, or late June, we started seeing, you know, the rates spiking up significantly because of concern about inflation, because of concern about, you know, whether we are going to be able to contain the inflationary pressure. So it actually spiked all the way up because the, 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 uh, the speculation is, you know, Federal Reserve will increase interest rate, and they did. 
So interest rates for Freddie Mac actually uh, went on 30 year fixed rate went all the way up to maybe about 5.8 or so. And then the blue line went all the way up to 6.1 or 6.2 percent. So and because of that spike in that uh, in mid June and a lot of closed sales that happened in July actually uh, open escrow in in uh, in June. Right. So when they when people saw, you know, some of those uh, increase in interest rate. They start pulling back a little bit. Some of you may have experienced that too. Some of your clients uh, were a little concerned. And as such, you know, July sales actually will turn out, and you will see in the news release tomorrow, that turn out to be, you know, worse than in June, partly because of that reason. But I want to look forward a little bit. If you take a look at the rates, you know, in uh, in the the red line, the the blue line, and the orange line, you can see that rates actually start dipping after it peaked in 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 June, in mid June, and Part of the reason for that dip is because we're seeing some inflationary pressures being uh, coming down, started coming down. You know, some of the latest reports that we've seen uh, from the uh, regarding interest rate, uh, regarding inflation rate, it actually hit 9.1% in June, and then it started coming back down in 8.5%. Now that number is still very, very high, uh, but we're seeing a, a, some slowdown. Part of that is because of you know gas prices actually coming down a little bit. But uh, also, it could be because of supply constraints in general actually are loosening loosening up a little bit. You know what happened in China? They had you know the uh, the uh, zero case tolerance um, policy uh, a couple months ago, but it started actually easing, and so supply constraint is actually getting better. But of course, even if we are seeing some slowdown in rates, take a look at the slide on the right hand side. You can see this slide is the um, speculation of the federal officials, the, the Federal Reserve officials. Um, usually, you know, Federal Reserve officials, they cast a their, their, their vote on what they believe the Fed funds rate is going to end up with at the end of the year. So here in 2022, there are some votes from the federal officials. They, they, they speculate on what the rates could be at the end of the year for Fed funds rate. And that's for 2023 and 2024. What this suggests to me is all these dotted lines are different opinions, and you know the median or the average, med uh, the midpoint of that uh, of their uh, of the speculation is that it is somewhere around three point two five uh, or so, three point three seven five to be exact. Now, what is the rate right now for Fed funds rate right now? The Fed funds rate right now is about two point five, if I remember correctly. So there will there are still a bit of room to grow. You know, by the end of the year. So that suggests that the Federal Reserve will likely increase rates by another 75 basis point or another 100 basis point, depending on the inflationary pressure that they're going to see and the market as a whole. Um, and how does that, how does this re actually relate to our interest rates, our 30 year fixed rates? Now, of course, the Fed funds rate is a short term rates, but it actually ties in with the market. You can kind of get a sense of what the market is like, what the 30 year fixed rate is like, you know, based on that fast front, Fed funds rate. Um, usually if you add, there is a difference of, you know, hundred basis point between the Fed funds rate to the 10 year bond. And then there is an additional 200 basis point or 180 basis point between the 10 year and the 30 years. So if you add on maybe about 280 basis point or 300 basis point to this number, that's your speculation. That's the estimate for the six, uh, the thirty-year fixed rate. So it looks like the thirty-year fixed rate, if you base on this chart, it is going to be right around six to six point two five percent. Now, do I believe that that is going to happen? We are. Are we going to see you know rates going back all the way up to six point two five? Well, it's really hard to say because we actually got there, you know, uh, for 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 a day or two or so. If you look at the Mortgage News Daily. So there's a chance that we might actually see rates started kind of climbing up later this year if you know we start seeing some inflationary pressure. Um, I would say though, right now you know with rates at around 5.3 ish or so, 5.2 depending on what you what source you look at, this is actually a good window for some of the buyers to actually jump in to, to get their home because now there's a little bit more supply. The rates are actually a little bit better compared to two months ago. Going forward, it's really hard to say. Take a look at this chart. It's not just the Federal Reserve that is adjusting rates. This is a chart that shows you the different central banks in different countries. They're all based on those numbers, based on those, uh, those um, uh, bullet points there. 
you can see that many of the central banks plan on raising rates further at the end of la after uh, the end of this year, before the end of this year. Federal Reserve, our central bank, plan uh, probably will raise rates by 50 basis point in September, maybe in November, and maybe even December. Uh, but some of the other central banks plan on doing the same thing as well. If they actually, if many of these central banks started raising rates further, that most likely will lead to an increase in uh, interest rates overall in the long term. Um, many of those have already priced in. To be to be to be honest with you, many of the, the thirty year fixed rates have been um, is a long term rate and have been priced in by you know the bond market. So some of them may have been priced in already. But at the same time, if there are any, if we start seeing any um, surprises from you know the from the economy, from the central banks, it could actually change rates a little bit. And inflation and interest rates, they are having an influence on buyers and sellers. Now, this is a survey that we do on a regular basis, on a monthly basis, and it shows that we ask a questions about whether inflation actually have an effect on their buyers and sellers plan. We ask our members. And based on the survey results, take a look at you know, some of these answers. For the last few months, going back to May, you can see the number of people who said, you know, inflation is delaying my client's home buying plan actually has been increasing. Uh, lately, it actually increased to 41%. Uh, and some of them actually even said, you know, the cl my clients are actually canceling their home buying plan because of inflation. And that's because of interest rate. But it also affects sellers as well. Take a look at, you know, right here and this this one and maybe this one right here. Um, some of our members, some of the realtors said, you know, inflation is delaying their clients' home, home selling plans. It went, it, uh, went up from about 5 or 6% to 10%. And canceling, it's actually a small number, but it still actually go, uh, is, uh, represents about 4%. So it does have an impact and it actually affects, you know, buyers and sellers uh, optimism about, you know, buying or selling. This is another survey that we uh, conduct every month also. We ask you know, what consumers directly whether they think it's a good time to buy or it's a good time to sell. 16% um, said you know, it's a good time to, to buy. Now, take a look at how it actually improved in the last two months. Maybe interest rates slowing down a little bit may have an impact, but if you look at how it compares to a year ago, it's still below last year's level. So the good time to buy is still at a very low level compared to you know uh, historic norm and a good time to sell actually dipped slightly from 61% as compared to 70%. So you can see that you know the optimism is not as high as before because of concerns about you know the market, concerns about interest rates. But one thing that you can take a look at and see from uh, from your own listings, you know that you know there are a bit more listings up on the market. Now part of it could be because some people, you know, some uh, sellers, they want to put their house off the market to sell before the, the market, you know, turns uh, downshift a bit more. But some of it could be because of the pullback in demand. And that's why we're seeing more carried over from the previous month. But you can see that active listings actually increased by double digit in the last couple months. A little bit more supply for your, for, for, for buyers, which is good, you know, for them to be able to pick and choose. But at the same time, of course, they have to be concerned about costs of borrowing as well. Now, as I mentioned, you know, active listing increasing partly because of pullback in demand, but we do have some increase in supply, at least in, in June. I can tell you that uh, uh, supply in, uh, in July actually slowed down a little bit. But if you look at the new listings uh, in uh, June, it actually started rise. It's actually it continued to rise, and it's actually at it was at the highest in, a lot, in, uh, in nearly three years. July actually dipped slightly, but not a whole lot. So we still have more listings, uh, but and and active listings continue to improve. Uh, with more new listings, what's going to what what happen is you have you know, the market is not as competitive. Now, uh, last time six months ago when I was here to talk about the competitiveness competitiveness of the market, um, I probably show you, you know, the number of 70% or 65%. That means the percent of homes being sold with a price above asking price. Uh, and a lot of people wanted to, you know, because of the tight supply of the market, they wanted to compete. They wanted to offer a, a high price, but they were able to offer a high price primarily because interest rate was low. But interest rates started going down, uh, started, started going up 
and the cost of borrowing actually is much higher. I don't even remember whether I have a slide here that shows you the, the, the mortgage payment as compared to last year. Uh, if you buy the same home as compared to last year, because interest rates have increased by about 200 to 250 basis point, the cost of borrowing or the monthly mortgage payment for the same house actually increased by about 40%. That's pretty significant. Obviously, you know, not everyone is going to stick to the same plan as what they had last year. Some may be more creative in financing. Some may be putting down a little bit more down payment. But of course, with interest rate rising so significantly, some of the people may not be able to compete. And that's why we're seeing some drop off in a number of people who offered a price above asking price being a little bit lower. 58.8% is the number in, in June. And I'll tell you that the number in July actually dipped below 50%. And the time and market actually start inching up, you know, with uh, with uh, the uh, uh, with uh, more homes being available. Uh, the market is not as competitive, and that's why the time and market actually start rising a little bit. Now, I'm not saying that the market is not tight. This market is still tight because the supply is still very, very. You know, it, even though it has gone up to the pre-pandemic level, it's still considered very tight. Now, before we go into the economic variables the factors, you know, what actually might affect the market um, in, in terms of the economy. Let's take a look at the regional stuff. I have a lot of regional numbers here. I have some local statistics here as well. Um, I may not, in this PowerPoint presentation, I may not be able to go over every single slide, uh, but I'll uh, at least, you know, kind of give you an idea and also tell you where you may be able to find some slides that I may not have presented here. But first, let's take a look at the regional and then county and then we're going, we're going to go into some local statistics. Now, at the, at the regional level, this is Southern California. This includes, you know, uh, uh, LA, Orange County, Riverside, San Bernardino, Ventura, um, and it, it includes San Diego as well. It shows a very similar story. On a year-over-year -year basis for sales, it's dropped just like the state number. It dropped by about 27% in June. Uh, and on a, on the first, for the first six months, it's actually dropped by about 15%. But if you look at price, your, your buyers will always ask you about price, right? How's price doing? How are we, are we seeing some dip in price in, um, in California? It's still holding up okay. It's still holding up at 8.4% compared to last year. I will tell you this though, if, you're, if your buyer asks about whether prices are going to decline, I will admit that you know, it is going to decline from the peak. The peak, which was probably set in May, we probably have declined from the peak um, in July or August uh, already, but that's typically happens, you know, in a uh, in a year when we have some seasonality. Peak price usually appeared in May or June and then started declining further. Now, of course, this year it could be affected by interest rates as well because interest rate has climbed. But we are also going to see, uh, as I as I mentioned, some uh, some 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 bounce back in sales or competitiveness because of interest rates actually uh, being a little bit lower. Now, whether interest rates will continue to rise, um, that of course is something that we'll discuss a little further when we talk about outlook. But now let's go back to Southern California. Um, if you look at individual counties, I have listed here, you know, the six counties here. LA uh, is um, continue to, I, I listed LA at the top because I think, you know, that's will draw the most interest, uh, uh, most of your interest. Uh, it, it actually is, uh, if you look at the sales on a year-over-year -year basis compared to other counties, it's actually doing okay. Um, Orange County actually dipped quite a bit, you know, on a year-over-year -year basis. And even if you look at the first six months of the year, LA is actually doing better than, you know, some of the other counties. Um, and of course, it's still dip dipping by about 12% uh, double digit. Um, what about price? Price continue to hold on. For many counties in Southern California, we're seeing double digit. Um, Orange, Riverside, and San Bernardino continue to increase by uh, double digit. LA is actually moving along, but not as fast as you know the other counties, which may 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 not be a bad thing because it uh, didn't go up as fast. It probably wouldn't go back down uh, as fast as well. And if you take a look at the supply side, it's following similar trend as the state as a whole, and it's also increasing by 40, 50, 60 percent. Uh, in the latest you know, monthly statistics uh, in June. In July, 
don't quite remember what LA's numbers look like, but I'm pretty sure it increased by double digit, maybe by 30 to 40 percent on the supply side. So we're seeing some improvement in the supply side. Again, it's uh, it's it helps buyers um, to know that there's a little bit more uh, inventory in the market right now. And also, you know, interest rate or cost of borrowing is slightly better. I wouldn't necessarily say that it's improved significantly. Obviously, it's not because it's only down from you know five point let's say eight to five point three but that's actually um not bad you know compared to a, you know a few weeks ago and the competitiveness of course for la over time it actually also started slowing down a little bit showing a little bit of uh, drop off or ease of competitiveness as well now let's take a look at some local market statistics I, again, I won't be able to go over every single slide because that includes a lot of slides here for you to use. I will be sending this PowerPoint sli uh, slide deck to, to, to many and to, to Kim um, so that they can sh uh, circulate. Uh, but let's take a look at some of these local statistics. I include uh, quite a few areas, Calabasas, uh, I think Long Beach and um, some other areas as well. Um, the story is uh, pretty similar. I'm going to show you uh, in the next uh, five minutes or so slides for the uh, most current month, which is June, for that individual immediate area. And then I'm going to show a slide right after this, uh, or right after the monthly number, to show you the year to date number. So the first year, first half of the year number. The story is pretty much the same, it's very similar. Price continue to increase, uh, but in June, it increased at a more moderate level. Uh, and in the case of Agoura Hills, six, close to 6% for the median price. But you're also going to see sales actually dipping in the latest month because of you know interest rate hikes, uh, and at the same time you see you will see most of it, most in most slides not all of them most slides actually seeing some improvement in active listings as well. So here we go. This is June number for Agri Hill. Um, this is a six month number. Obviously, we are seeing some dip uh, on sales. And even with some improvement in active listings in, in June, we're seeing some slowdown in active listing uh, for the first six months overall. Now, the bottom, the numbers at the bottom, those are competitive market competitiveness measures, including days on market, including sales to list price ratio, and including the uh, percent of uh, uh, listings with reductions. Um, so here are some numbers, and I'm not going to, I won't, have, I probably don't have all the cities that you're looking for. So I'll tell you at the end where you might be able to get some of these slides uh, from, from our website yourself. Uh, Calabasas, I'm gonna quickly go over them. Um, you see some dip in price in the latest month, but sales improve uh, and you see some uh, increase in improvement in active listings. This is a six month slide again. Um, some slow down in the six month median price uh, with sales dropping and active listings also drop for the six months. West Lake Village, um, some improvement in price. Sales increased by, uh, sales actually dipped by 34%. Some, some areas are going to hit a little harder in, the, in, the, in June compared to you know, the other areas. Um, and for the six months, also seeing a dip in sales and inventory for West Lake Village. What about Long Beach? Long Beach, I have a couple of cities in Long Beach. Uh, slight increase in price, sales dip slightly. Uh, by double digit in home sales, but active listings start improving. Uh, you're seeing some uh, for the six months in Lakewood actually uh, increase in active listings and price. Uh, and in Long Beach, there's a, a bit of uh, a little bit of improvement in price. Sales actually dipped close to 20% with active listing increasing by 31%. Uh, here's the, uh, the, the six months number. Um, what about South Bay? South Bay, I have like five or six cities uh, with Gardena actually increasing in price by close to 27%. Not bad at all. And price actually, and sales actually dipped slightly with active listing increasing. Um, six months wise, we're still seeing some improvement in price and active listings actually not bad at all increasing a little bit, but sales continue to dip. Hermosa Beach, um, increase in sales and price in June dip in active listings and uh, this is a six months uh, uh, period again uh, and ha Manhattan Beach um, we're seeing some fluctuation in sales in, in Manhattan Beach even though you know prices continue to stay at a pretty elevated level and here's the six months when we look at the, uh, the first half of the year 
Those really um, estates uh, increase in sales, price, and active listings in June. Uh, but if you look at the six month period, actually showing a dip in active listings as well as as well as sales, rental Palos Verdes, um, here's the six months, and there's one other area, so Redondo Beach, um, an increase in price and increase in listings, but sales, again, you're seeing some similar trend, like I said earlier, sales continue to decline um, in, in the latest month because of the down shift in the market, uh, and uh, active listings and sales dipped actually for six months. Corns, uh, similarly, an increase in active listings and price continue to stay pretty uh, stable and strong, uh, but sales actually continue to dip. One more region or one more area, which is the west side. Beverly Hills increased by 6% in terms of median price. Listings actually increased slightly by 0.6%. Uh, and um, six months, uh, it's showing some dec decline in sales and active listings. Cover City. Cover City seems to be uh, uh, getting a, a hit hard uh, in, in June um, in the latest report. Uh, and for the first six months, it's actually also showing some slowdown. And I think this is the last local statistics slide. Um, Santa Monica with a 25% increase in median price, active listings and sales both dropped in June. And uh, for the first six months, it's also ha also has been seeing some decline. It might be because of the very tight inventory. Now, so those slides will be in the slide deck and I will show you, I'll verbally tell you where you can get those slides if it's if uh, you're not finding a cities that you want. It's on the um, CR website. It's in industry, go to industry 360 and you see the market data page. On the left-hand side of the page, there is something called the housing market overview. Click on housing market overview, you see a few dashboards. One is the monthly dashboard, and then there is one called housing year to date. Um, it should be pretty easy to find, uh, but uh, feel free to let me know, you know if you couldn't find it um, and send me an email. I, my email address is at the very end. So let's take a look at the economic big pictures for now. Now you saw all those listing, you saw those statistics at the local level, the statistics at the, uh, state level and the regional level, uh, we're seeing some slowdown and it is because of inflation, as I mentioned. But the question is whether that is going to continue to improve or going, and it's, uh, it's going to lead to, you know, interest rate not fly, flying up or interest rising as fast. Now take a look at these headline numbers. Now the chart on the left-hand side show you the inflation number. The inflation has been flaring up, as I mentioned earlier. Take a look at this blue line right here. It used to be about 2%, 2.5% you know, for the longest time. And then of course it started rate, uh, uh, rising significantly all the way to right here about 9.1%. But you can see that things actually started dipping in 8 .5 to 8.5% in the latest month. Now, one data point obviously doesn't make a trend. So uh, don't count on just, that just one data point, but take a look at the slide on the graphs, graphics on the uh, right-hand side. These are numbers projected by UCLA. You can see the red, those red bars are projections. Actually, the second quarter should not be a projection, but you can see that you know the consumer price index inflation number actually should be started should start uh, declining. But even by the end of this year, we're still going to see a 7.4 percent inflation rate as compared to only two and a half percent pre-pandemic level. So it's going to take some time. By the end of next year, we probably will get to the level that we want to get to, but it's going to take some work. The Federal Reserve uh, is working on, you know, raising rates to actually keep demand down. By keeping demand down, they're hoping that it will actually put a balance between supply and demand because supply is the issue. And consumers, they have been, they have some expectation. You know, some of the consumers being uh, surveyed by the New York Fed, take a look at the red line and the uh, blue line, suggest that they believe they started, they, they actually, you can see that, you know, the, the, the expectation uh, started flaring up, you know, in the mid of 2021, actually went all the way up to six and a half, seven percent because they can feel it. You know, we all can feel it. You, we all, you know, when we go to the uh, gas pump, we know, we notice that, you know, gas prices have gone up. But recently, in the last few weeks, we started seeing, I think in the last 60 days or so, we started seeing some dip 
in uh, gas prices and some of the uh, uh, prices in a grocery store or supermarket. So consumer expectation actually started coming down. Take a look at the blue line. Blue line suggests that we are seeing some improvement in consumer expectation for inflation, which is a good thing because when consumers start thinking might be a little bit more positively, they start spending a bit more, they start doing, uh, conducting some economic activity that actually will lead to a better economic growth. Uh, that's that psychology. Now, it's not just consumers' expectation. It's actually, you know, based on some real supply chain um, elements as well. If you look at this chart, this chart is put together by, you know, the Philadelphia Fed, New York Fed, and Dallas Fed. If you look at these lines, um, the line right here, the, the dark black line right here, that's an index figure that shows you the long-term uh, rate. What is the long-term rate of? This is the long-term of the delivery time. Now, when a product uh, get uh, delivered from the warehouse to you know, the shelf, it takes some time. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer. Sometimes it takes a, li a little less. In the past two years, that delivery time has been a little bit longer because of delay in shipping, delay of a lot of things. So this dark line, this black line right there is the long run average. And these lines right here, they're how it diffuse from the long run average. If we are seeing a positive number, that means we are seeing a longer delivery time. Longer delivery time usually means there will be a shortage of products and that will lead to higher inflation. And you can see you know, that things were actually pretty messy in you know, the last two years. Uh, but we started seeing some decline in the last few months, in the last couple months or so. The delivery time is improving. So that's good. That means supply constraint is actually improving. Um, and here's another slide uh, at the global level that show you that shows you, you know, the same similar zero line is the long run average and the blue line is how it deviates. This takes into account not just the delivery time, but other factors, other variables regarding supply chain. And it looks like the supply chain health, even though it's not back to the zero line yet, it's actually improving. We're seeing some improvement. So supply chain improving means, you know, the inflationary pressure is a little bit better. Now, consumers, this is another survey of consumer expectation. Consumers, you know, if they actually uh, have to pay a higher price on goods, they don't feel good uh, as good, you know, with their financial well-being, right? And that's what happened in, in this chart right here. This shows you their expectation of whether they believe they are going to be financially better off or worse off one year from now. The orange line is somewhat worse off. The blue line, blue bars is much worse off. You can see looking from looking at these bars, we actually saw the um, when you add the orange and the blue bars uh, in, in June, it actually uh, add up to a high, very high number last month or two months ago. That means that was probably the worst time when inflation actually hit at 9.1%. But we can also see that it started actually coming down a little bit. Now it's still not, you know, we're still not out of the wood, still at a high level, and nearly 40% of all households actually said they will be financially worse off as compared to below 20% you know, in 2020 or before 2020. So we still have a lot of work to do, but at the same time, it's showing some sign of improvement. Now, what about you know the actual economic activity? Now, people feel worse off. Are they still buying? Uh, because inflation obviously is something that we need to be concerned about. But at the same time, inflation could cause you know high inflation. If the Federal Reserve try to calm it down, will lead to you know some uh, economic activity cutting back. Let's take a look at how inflation might have actually taken a toll on you know uh, retail sales. Now, if you look at this retail sales number. Um, these numbers shows you the change from uh, past month or past year. A positive number will be a, a good number, obviously. If you look at the one percent increase compared to you know the retail sales, uh, the retail sales in June compared to May, it shows a one percent increase. It shows that you know we're increasing our activity. That's great. Same for year over year, eight point four percent increase. That's a good number. Um, and compared to the uh, January twenty twenty. Before the pandemic, it's actually show an increase of 29.9%. So we're looking at a good thing, right? We're looking at something very, very positive, right? Well, let's pause for a second. Those numbers, 
do not take into account inflation. When you take into account inflation, you should look at the real retail sales number, which is right around right at the bottom. If you take into the real inflationary pressure, it's actually showing a negative number. It means economic activities in terms of dollar actually has come uh, has come down. Now, except for maybe the uh, percent change from the pre-pandemic level, we're showing positive. So we're seeing some slowdown in economic activity if we account for inflation. But so you know, we are seeing some inflationary concerns, and you probably have seen you know some news about you know real GDP. A couple of weeks ago, there is a release of the economic uh, report on whether the economy is growing, and you might have heard, you know, by, uh, uh, by definition, some technical definition or an official definition, when we have two consecutive quarters of uh, GDP declining or economic activity declining, that is usually considered a recession. The question is whether we are in recessions or not. You know, we did have the first quarter being, dip, uh, being dropped off by 1.6%, uh, and then follow up with the second quarter with a 0.9% drop in GDP. So. Should we be concerned? Are we in a recession? Uh, well, a lot of people ask, you know, about that question. And well, the first question I'll ask is, do you feel like you're in a recession? I think some people do. But at the same time, let's take a look at some number. When you're in a recession or in a past, when uh, we are in a recession, usually what happens when a recession happens and then we see some drop off in the labor market, number of people uh, being employed. Take a look at this gray line, these gray lines. This uh, point right here, right in the middle, where the red and the dark, uh, uh, the black and the gray lines meet, that's actually is the peak of, that signifies the peak of a business cycle. So that's the highest point of a business cycle. From that point on, if we actually started uh, slowing down, hypothetically speaking, we should see some de uh, decline in uh, uh, non-farm employment, the number of people being employed, right? And that actually shows for all these gray lines, after the peak, things actually start slowing down, fewer people being hired. And even the average of, of the last 60 years, 70 years, shows that the, the line actually started declining. But what about the red line right here? The red line is the current business cycle. Even after what we considered the peak of our economy or economic activity, we still con continue to hire and we hire a lot more. So does it feel like that we are in recessions? Maybe by that technical definitions, yes. But you know, it still be, have to be officially um, signed off by, by you know, an, um, an economic entity. Um, I don't think it is, we are at a recession now. Are we going to get into recessions? That's a possibility though. Look at the unemployment right now. Employment is still at three and a half percent. And we're still showing a wage growth of you know, about 5% or so. So the labor market is actually doing very well. The question is, you know, what, what, what's going to happen six months from now or about a year from now? There are, there are signs that we might be actually going into recessions. Um, if you take a look at something called the yield curve, some of you may be familiar with it. The yield curve is basically the difference between the 10-year yield interest rate minus the two-year yield rate. Let's think about it. Let's think of it this way. Um, when you look at the 30 year fixed rate versus the 15 year fixed rate, usually the 30 years uh, fixed rate uh, is a little bit higher compared to 15 years, right? For, for mortgage. And the reason why that is the case is if, you, if the lender have to uh, uh, lend money to a person for a longer term, there's a little bit more risk involved. And that's why the 15 years usually has a lower rate compared to the, 10, to the 30 years. Same for the 10 year versus the two year yield. So the 10 year minus two years yield usually should, have, should be a positive number because you know interest charge on a 10 year bond should be a little bit higher. But in the case of a, but in the case if the 10 year minus two year is a negative number, that is called the yield curve inversion. And that is why people are concerned because why would people actually charge uh, higher rates for two year bond versus 10 year? Unless they think that it is more risky to loan someone in a two year. Why is there more risk? Because there is a risk of a recession. And that's why, we're, we're con that's why people are concerned. And it does look like that. If you look at the chart on the right-hand side, 
the yield curve actually inverted for the last, I think, 20 some days or so. I can't remember the exact dates. So that means there are concerns. When the yield curve inverted, usually about 12 months or 18 months from the beginning of the yield curve inversion, that's when we have a recessions. Usually that's pretty accurate. So there's a possibility that we will get into recessions next year. And consumers actually are concerned. Now, this is not the latest number because I should I actually should have included the latest number because it bounced back. Consumer sentiment actually dipped, you know, when we when they saw the GDP number actually dipping down. But recently, with inflation number actually flaring up, they actually started improving. But at the same time, CEOs continue to be a little concerned. CEOs are business leaders, and they notice that, you know, if they, if they believe that a recession is coming, of course, they're going to cut back. Many of them actually did cut back because many of them, if you look at, look at, take a look at the slides, it shows you how many uh, uh, CEOs or CFO believe that we are either already in a recession or a recession is coming in 2023 and uh, late 2022 or 2023. You take a look at these numbers, 31%, for example, believe that we will have a recession in 2020, late 2023 or uh, 2022. And then another 17 or 18% believe that we will get into recession in 2023. So what happened when CEOs and our business leaders actually started cutting back? Well, of course, that means there will be a slowdown in economic activity. And actually, that will be a self-fulfilling prophecy of getting into a recession. Um, and for now, we believe the economy is going to be actually, this is our outlook. We believe in 2022 that we're going to see some slowdown. It's go still going to grow by about 2.1%, but we might actually have to make some adjustment later this year if it continues to actually slow down uh, significantly. Uh, but we believe 2023, there will be some slowdown in um, 2023. And, and then it will actually drop off uh, by about maybe maybe by about a couple of percentage uh, in the first or second quarter before climbing back up. Now, what about uh, CPI? For inflation, it actually has been increasing by about 7.6%. We believe it's going to increase by 7.6% in 2022. It is going to actually increase lower than what we saw earlier that I said, you know, it is increasing by 8.5% right now, but it is going to actually drop to 7.4% at the end of the year. Now, next year is the year that we will see some slowdown in inflation, which is going to be uh, very welcoming. Uh, but it's not going to happen until next year. What about the economy for California? It is going to drop by about, uh, it's, it's going to improve uh, in terms of non-farm job growth by about 4%. And in 2023, a 2% or 1.8% improvement in 2023. So in California, we're still going to see some decent uh, labor market improvement or economy uh, continue to improve. But at the same time, we will see a slowdown in population growth because of higher cost of living and everything else. Now, last five minutes, let me uh, put everything together to talk about the market, the, econ uh, the economic outlook. Um, right now, we're seeing a, uh, a slowdown in housing demand. We're seeing somebody, based on our June's number and the July number, which we will release tomorrow, it shows that pending sales actually declined. Um, it continued to decline in July actually by a little bit more than 30%. Uh, 30 some percent. Um, so pending sales suggest that closed sales will continue to, to drop. And you can see also based on mortgage applications that purchase applications actually, this, this green uh, orange bar that's mortgage application index for this year. And these lines are you know, previous year's number. We haven't below um, last year or previous year's number for, for the last few years, uh, for the last few, few weeks. So it most likely will continue to, to uh, decline, sorry about that, um, for the next few months. So as our expectation, in the next few months, we probably uh, have to expect you know, sales actually to close sales to decline uh, by about you know, 15 to 20% compared to last year. Remember, last year was pretty strong. So a decline uh, from last year is not catastrophic, but at the same time, it is definitely softer. Um, if you take a look at you know the price wise though, despite the fact that we are seeing some drop off in sales, where prices are probably going to hold tight. Uh, when I say hold tight for the rest of this year, 
we probably will see you know prices compared to the peak dropping by maybe about um, five or six percent or so. But when compared to last year, we're still going to see an increase of three or four percent, uh, three or four percent for the rest of the year. For the entire year, it probably will be closer to ten percent compared to twenty twenty one. Now next year though. I will have to tell you that you know most likely we will see a decline, and I'll show you in our forecast uh, in a minute. Um, mortgage payment is one of the reasons why we are seeing some drop off in, in price because people have to pay a big, a much higher rate. As I showed you earlier, uh, this number, uh, the mortgage payment is going up by has been going up by about 40, 50 percent. Uh, it may actually not reach 50 percent um, as uh, interest rate actually start taming a little bit. But still, a 30 to 40 percent increase in mortgage payments—that's pretty tough for many of the buyers, uh, and that is going to have a hit on affordability. Uh, we expect affordability. Recently, in the first quarter, it was 24 percent. Second quarter has actually dropped to 16 percent, meaning only 16 percent of all households can afford to buy a medium-priced home. That definitely affects, you know, buyers' uh, desire to buy. That makes it a little tough for them. But in the long run, we still believe that there's a lot of potential because if you look at, you know, these uh, age segment, these orange uh, lines, those are age segments of home buyers. Many of them are turning into 26 to 34. This is their prime year to become a, uh, to, to establish a family, establish a household. They need to either rent or buy. So some of them will be turned into first time buyers. Uh, and the but but the issue uh, will continue. We still have issues with supply constraints, which I showed before. Unless we uh, resolve the supply constraints, we will continue to have higher prices, and that might not make it very easy for housing affordability. Um, and if if some of you may ask, you know, whether we are going to see a lot of properties being foreclosed because of you know the uh, decline in of the uh, the the slowdown in the housing market. My, my response is that most likely we're not and because of different reasons. Take a look at the first quarter number from CoreLogic. This shows you how many people are underwater, sort of, or you know, um, with uh, negative equity. In 2008 or nine, during the housing crisis, we have in California about 30 some percent people actually being underwater. This time around, only about 0.7%. When people are underwater, they could actually have their uh, property foreclosed and turn their self, uh, turn their keys back to the uh, to their lenders. But with 0.7 percent, most likely not. This is the numbers that I referred to earlier: 30 percent or 35 percent at the uh, national level. Um, and part of the reasons why people are not foreclosing is because they actually put a lot of money in their uh, when they actually purchase their home. Back in 2006 or seven. We have 21% of uh, people of buyers actually purchase home with zero down payment. Today, only about 3%. So that's the difference. And here's the outlook for our 2022 and 2023. Now we will have our 23, 20, 20, 2022 and 2023 numbers revised when we at, at REI in a couple months. Uh, but here are the numbers for now. Um, we expect a 14% drop this year in sales, and then another 5% drop in sales in 2023. What about price? Price, we expect prices to actually increase by about eight or 9% or 10% um, for the year as a whole, but it's probably going to drop by 7.1% in 2023. Now take a look at this number though. This number, even if it dropped by 7.1% compared to 2021, it's still higher than the 2021 number and the 2020 number. Now, some, some of you may ask, you know, or some of you may get questions from buyers saying, okay, well, you know, home prices are going to drop, right? Um, my, my answer is yes, it could drop, you know, in 2023, but at the same time, if you are a buyer who hold, uh, plan to hold on for two years or three years or so, chances are your, your prices are going to go back up and it will be back up to 2021 level. And this time around, uh, it's not going to actually, it will go back up to about the 2022 level. Um, and this time around, it's a little different, you know, uh, compared to 15 years ago, because we're not seeing all those foreclosure. We're not going to see those distressed sales. So as such, uh, here's my uh, uh, bullet points for the conclu conclusion. We are, we are going to see some slowdown in demand. 
um, partly because of interest rates. Uh, inflation is still uh, is not under control. Um, supply is still still going to be an issue. We will continue to have supply shortage in the next probably 18 months to two years, even though we're seeing some improvement. Price-wise, we will see a price uh, for the annual price being a little bit higher compared to to uh, a year ago, two years ago, and it's going to dip, you know, in 2023, but it's going to come back up probably in uh, 2024 at a very moderate rate in 2024 and 2025. Uh, what about recessions? Yes, we might actually get into recessions. I, I'm still hoping that we will get to a soft lending, but there's a possibility of a recessions, but the recessions is actually different compared to previous years. This recessions, if we're going to get into one, most likely will be a very soft recession and, uh, and things will actually climb back up in a very short period of time. And with that said, uh, there are a couple of things I wanna share with you. Um, there's a Woman Up event, some of you may know, that's coming up in, uh, at the end of this month, early next month. Um, and of course, REI, that's what I've been uh, saying before. Uh, Reimagine, it's going to be in October, October 11th to, through 13th. Uh, I think I mentioned earlier at the beginning to many and to all of you, we are going to the research and economics team. We're going to have a, a booth uh, at the uh, Trade Center this year. So feel free to come by. And of course, we have our chief economist, Jordan Levine, doing a, a keynote uh, luncheon on Wednesday, I believe. Uh, and uh, with that said, that is my uh, my email address, oscarw at car.org. Um, and let me turn it back to many. Ask away. Um, always uh, good stuff. Uh, and uh, a lot of uh, data to uh, digest the next uh, few hours and days and months ahead. But it's always uh, good information. I'm looking forward to get that uh, slides from you, uh, the slide day, because I'm going to share with everybody, plus the recordings. Yes. And uh, I know that you have to jump on the other call, but we're going to see you uh, in a couple of months in the events in, in person. So looking forward to that. Absolutely. And I'll send you the slide deck um, maybe in an hour or so after um, the next meeting that I have. All right, that's go away. Uh, Chief Economist uh, CER, thank you so much as always. Much thank you, many. Have a good one, everyone. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That was just a lot of good stuff, huh? Uh, but gives a lot of like also like, you know, content for conversations. Um, to you know, with your you know buyers and sellers to the uh, you know near near future and you know into twenty twenty three, uh, Simon, uh, we didn't have any slides for you, but anything you want to add? No, no, no. I was more of a participant. Great information, to, uh, but I'll definitely have it on our next uh, team meeting. Yeah. So again, thanks, Simon. Once I'm uh, going to get information uh, through Kim, we're going to share it with everybody. Thanks for being here, guys. We'll see you. Uh, see you soon. Take care.